Hey, Glock 45 here. How do you like my new lightweight, small rifle? Yeah. How do you like pack that thing around? Well, many of you know what it is. It's a BAR model of 1918, 30-06. We've got some of that to feed it. Thanks to Federal. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, this is an old war horse from actually World War I, the latter stages of it. And then, of course, a real war horse in World War II, in Korea, and even uh, saw some use in the early days of Vietnam, as I understand. May you've seen this rifle if you've watched military you know, movies. You've, you've seen it extensively, probably. It's one of those, though, you may not have ever actually picked up. You might not have even seen it in a, uh, move, or in a uh, gun show, uh, gun shop, but <laughs> it is a large rifle, no doubt about it. it. was really, I think it was the first select fire uh, you know, rifle made by Americans and used by Americans and you know, manufactured by Americans, I believe. As I understand, I mean, think about it, 1917. And let me give you a really tough quiz. Who do you think would have come up with something like this back in 1917? Yeah, a guy named John Browning. John Browning. So, 30-06. We got a couple of other ornaments out here for it. Grand, this. Those two table decorations were actually used in World War II. This was not because it is a replica made by Ohio Ordnance Works. And it's pretty much an exact replica. Now there are different variations of this, like with any firearm that has lasted for decades or used for decades. You know, there's improvements. There's the A1, the A2. This is the A3-02, I think it's called. And, uh, you know, some, some smaller changes. The early ones had more walnut on them. And of course they went to a Bakelite or polymers or something in the later years. And so you have some changes, but basically that's it. The BAR, Big boy, 30-06, uh, lock breech system, gas operated. Uh, you can actually adjust the gas system. I'm not going to. A little bit difficult to break down, as I understand. You're a little bit tricky. You gotta know what you're doing. Borrowed this one from a fellow at Tennessee Gun Country up in Clarksville. We appreciate the, uh, their lending it to us. Boy, do we. And uh, so I'm not gonna take it apart. Uh, <laughs> I don't wanna take a chance on this one. I don't think many of you are probably looking uh, for a field strip uh, video on the uh, BAR model of 1918 so you know how to take yours down necessarily anyway, so we won't risk messing up. In fact, we're not even going to shoot it. You know better than that, don't you? <laughs> you know, I was kidding there because we have ammo and we're going to take a couple of shots. So let's just, let's, what I thought I'd do is, is shoot the thing just on the bipod to begin with and uh, see if I can hit the red plate with it. We've not really messed with the sights, but they seem like they might be on. It's a little bit awkward, <laughs> to say the least. It is a large, heavy thing. It weighs 20 pounds. Uh, dry or wet, it's around 20 pounds. And uh, my creaky stool here doesn't break on me. All right, <laughs> I have enough light to, to see that. All right, again, it is, uh, you know, it's a select fire. But now this one is semi-automatic, right? It's semi-automatic. Uh, Ohio Ordnance Works makes this, and again, it's a replica of the original. They do a great job, but you know, it is semi-automatic, so anybody really can go buy one of these. All right, so we should have a round in the chamber. Let's see if I can get in position here to pop that red plate. All right. And of course, you've seen these guys, they carry these things and they wouldn't always, they would just shoot them offhand. I better get the safety off. All right, the trigger's not all that bad on the thing. But it's loud. I think I hit the plate, but I didn't hear it because I didn't have my ears in. <laughs> I'm sure that happened in combat, right? Let's try it again. There we go, all right. Oh, yeah, I could hear it that time. Nice. Hits it hard. Oop, tried to flinch. <laughs> Let's pop it again. 
put the safety on. That's pretty cool. Oh, you know what? While we've got the bipod up, let's see if we can hit a two liter here at close range using the bipod. If I can see it, there it is. <laughs> it worked, didn't it? All right, safety on. Oh man, is that thing a beauty or what? It is heavy, it is heavy. So uh, how would you like to have been assigned to carry that thing around through Europe? People did, small people even. Uh, the fellow who owns this up at Tennessee Gun Country was talking about a friend of his, his father who, who uh, yeah, carried one of these all through Europe. And he was, uh, I forgot what he five eight or something. But it's a very small guy, soaking wet, 140, that kind of thing. Carry this thing around, and the stories he tells is that he got used to it. You know, that was his rifle, and that's just what he got used to. And it, like you do, you get used to anything. Uh, I think a lot of them would take, of course, the handle off. And they take the bipod off, and what I'm going to do is, oh man, I'll tell you what. Let's do. Let's shoot with a bipod on offhand here, though. First, though. Cause it looks so cool before we even fold it up. Cause I have, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 rounds left there. 20 round magazine. What should we shoot? All right, now if you want to shoot one of these full auto, uh, you can, it just depends on your finger, right? Cause it had a really slow rate of fire. If you recall, if you've ever seen one, let's try, let's try to shoot it uh, <laughs> full auto. <laughs> We cleared it, cleared that magazine, and with still some targets left. Let's see, let's make sure. Now the magazine release is right there. It's kind of an interesting magazine release. Push that button. Yep, it was empty. And pull that out while we have it empty. We'll double check. Smooth bolt. Let's fold up that bipod. Loosen these up. And yeah, let's see how that works. Not exactly high-tech design for today, maybe, but it works, doesn't it? Of course, you can loosen these and extend, you know, the, the bipod legs there. We don't really need to do that, I guess. We just fold them up. Ouch. Barrel's already warm. All right, that looks pretty cool, too, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're just in the look. As long as it looks cool, that's all that's important, right? Okay, let's put another magazine in that thing, and it's 20 pounds, and it feels like it. Oh, man, what a tank. What a tank. We have a magazine of ammunition. So let's see what we can shoot here. These things are uh, something else. I tell you, John and I both fired one, uh, the full auto, uh, an original BAR, the Lucky Gunner machine gun shoot a couple years ago, and it was pretty neat. But it is a slow rate of fire. I think when they were issued, I read in uh, around 3840, when they really uh, it became a uh, standard issue uh, in the Marines and I guess other places too. And I mean, it was used in World War One uh, towards the end of it, and it was proved effective. And they kept working on it, and, and then it became you know the rifle before World War. Uh, two broke out, but as I understand, when they issued them around the late uh, 30s, 1940, it didn't even have the select fire capability where you could shoot at semi-auto or, or or full auto. Full auto, it just had two full auto speeds, either around three or four hundred uh, rounds per minute, or you flipped it over to the other switch and it was uh, or setting and it was uh, five to six hundred rounds per minute. Okay, and so. Those were the two speeds. And if you think about it, if you know anything about those speeds, when you're down there around three or 400 rounds per minute, that's, what is that? That's like boom, 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 boom. That's almost, you can control that so well. You can even control 600 pretty well. So uh, we, were, uh, we were impressed firing the, the, uh, the real one, uh, full auto, but it was so easy to control. But think about it, it's 20 pounds. So it's going to be, all right. Let's put one in. All right, so I think we've got a little bit left there. Let's uh, finish that off, that bucket. <laughs> okay, 
That's good. Oh, look what I see right here. And my bipods are kind of falling a little bit. I uh, don't guess it matters as long as they don't get in front of the... <laughs> Got that. Uh, let me fold that back up here carefully. Didn't get it tight enough, did I? There we go. Ugh. Now see if I were in combat, I would uh, I would know how to do that properly. And you know what? Let's take out that other pot. Boy, it sure seems lame that little bitty pot, doesn't it? With this big old powerful. Uh, you know what? Let's do. Let me lay it down here. Safety's on. I'm going to point it that direction. Okay. She's safe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a more uh, BAR worthy target. How's that? A BAR worthy pot. Now there's a BAR worthy pot. How's that? <laughs> you think it'll take that one out? All right. There we go. That other pot almost uh, disrespects this worthy firearm. All right, let's put him on fire and let's uh, get here. We don't shoot any steel behind it. <laughs> ah, now we're ready. Let's hit that one for a warm up. <laughs> Took a piece of it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh man, and we still have a pot. Are we empty already? Wow. You just run out of ammo before you know it, don't you? We're on safe. Let me check it. Oh, this thing is big. I didn't think I was empty. Ah, well, I am. And of course, that is one of the issues that doesn't hold a lot of ammo. But boy, is it sweet to shoot. Let's load some uh, magazine. Well, at least one. We have some more targets out there. I see a little smoke from that, that pump. Uh, 20 rounds. Now I understand there were some either 30 or 40 round magazines uh, for a while. Don't know how long they were used. I read that they carried, the, the, whoever carried one of these, generally carried 12 magazines uh, himself. And someone else might have carried some too in some units where they had some help maybe for the person. But uh, the 12 magazines and the gun, that's 12 magazines full of ammo, and the gun uh, equaled, what, 40 pounds, I believe it said. So, you know, if you've got a small person carrying this, you've got 40 pounds, just the firearm and ammo, that's a lot. That's a lot. Can you believe it? I mean, John Browning just strikes again, doesn't he? I've seen, uh, you know, videos in the, the Dylan video, machine gun video, I think it was his daughter firing one of these things, and she looks about 100 pounds soaking wet. And, uh, it was a full auto model, and she was handling it pretty well. It was shaking her around a little bit, but it's got a low, slow rate of fire, and it's, again, that 20 pounds uh, really absorbed recoil. Think about it. You fired, most of you, a 308, something like that, and a 30 out 6 in a gun that's 7 or 8 pounds. Boy, you get up to 20, you get a lot of weight, a lot of weight. Appreciate Federal supplying the food for this baby. Didn't really expect to shoot so much 30 out 6 but uh, <laughs> I didn't know I was going to get this thing. We generally don't shoot all that much 30 out 6 It's got the Garand, of course, and maybe a random bolt gun. All right. That's some more food. Okay. Let's take a couple more shots. Oh, we've got a target there, don't we? We better, we better have a BAR target. I think we, we don't want to forget that. Somebody might enjoy a BAR target, paper target. I really do have those things loose. Maybe I need to, okay, we're definitely clear. Let's make sure, doubly clear. Yeah, there's nothing in there. And I guess there's a bolt lock back, I'm not sure. It's interesting how that's cut out there is on the stock, to, so that can be turned there. That ought to, yeah, well, don't worry about that. Okay, uh, let's just tighten him up here. There, put some, put some muscle behind it. Maybe that'll stay. There we go. All right, put a magazine in. 
it's so heavy and awkward it's kind of awkward to even uh, grab and you know operate I'm not sure how, how to get a hold of it okay we're on safe feels pretty smooth let's try that target there get that out of the way really it's kind of in the uh, there we go yeah I better get that down pat before I go to combat Safety off. I'm just going to kind of wing it. <laughs> I wasn't even using the sight. <laughs> okay. All right. You know what's got to be shot here? And you know, we should have enough rounds. What I fire about eight right there? I've got to in the magazine if I don't have enough. You know, I got to avoid hitting my. Should I shoot it from the waist or should I uh, aim? All right. I heard somebody say waist. All right, all right, let's put it on full auto. Well, I might be a little close here. Let's back up a little bit. I don't know, you know since we're shooting cinder blocks. All right, <laughs> all right, here we go with slow fire full auto. <laughs> oh, that was a good feeling. <laughs> it really was. Oh, we're gonna have to reload, reload. <laughs> Come on, Magazine. Come on out there. Needed one more round, didn't I? One more round. Okay. Wow. Let's get a couple more on that thing. That's good. Oh, I see a propane tank. Nice. He's trying to get away. Oh boy, I think it's empty. Yeah, not quite as ergonomic as a, an M14, M1A. <laughs> Lay it down. Woo! Man. But uh, you might be wondering uh, if, wow, why would you want to carry something that big? Even though it's a powerful round, and yeah, you've got full auto with it, but just give me my, wow my M1A or, or something. The thing is, this is 1917. Think about that. And then of course, anybody could handle it if you could carry it. Because even in full auto, because it was uh, so easy to, to handle. You know, there's, the recoil is very minimal. Now, one thing I didn't mention was why they even want something like this, something that big, that heavy. Uh, we learned in World War I you know, with trench warfare and everything, there were just times when it would really uh, be handy to have something you could throw out some lead as you're trying to advance and something full auto. And so this was really designed for infantrymen to, to walk and shoot, just like I was doing there, except I wasn't walking, but to just keep the heads down and advance uh, charge more or less. It was a, a walking uh, firearm charging firearm to just shoot as you're moving and uh, something that a person could carry because when you think about the machine guns the fully auto uh, weapons of the time in the military most of them are so big heavy even on big tripods you know like two and three man teams two and three man teams to even carry all the stuff and maybe the water cooled versions and all that well this was this was something that a person could just as heavy as it is you know, 12 magazines, uh, and you know, and if you practice with it and get a little more accomplished with it than I am, and where it's not so awkward, you could uh, still going to be heavy <laughs> for anybody, but uh, you could actually advance, you know, and lay down fully automatic fire, you know, and while well, other folks are getting into position, and so it, it served that purpose and a lot of others. And as I read, whoever had one of these was pretty much. Uh, uh, at the the point of the action quite often and maybe a dangerous uh, situation because these were so effective and uh and so so desired and, and i think they they issued these to like they have one on a squad and sometimes they have a rifleman squad with maybe nothing but these and just through the uh the evolution of strategies tactics uh, in the military they i think eventually ended up with where they wanted one person at least to have one of these was basically 
where it was, I think, in uh, World War II and, and uh, Korea. Can't speak uh, too much of that. I'm not expert in any of that, of course. But a uh, but pretty interesting firearm. And, it, you know, it's really neat that, that somebody makes this thing. I, I think they're the only people on the planet that make, that make this, this replica of this firearm, because it's very expensive to make. Can you imagine? I mean, how many of these are you going to sell in a year? Yeah. Uh, and so it is over four thousand dollars to make that, and uh, which is you know, pretty much a a replica, a, a quality replica of the old BAR, even though it's not uh, select fire. But this way, I mean, obviously, why? I, I guess it'd be legal. I don't know with all the right uh, uh, licenses and everything. But if you made one that was select fire, how many people are going to be able to buy it? You know, so. So even even at this, this is pretty cool that uh, that they make that. They've got some other different things like that, as I understand. I saw them up at Knob Creek last time I was up there. They've got a more modern. I don't know if you call it a version of this, but I don't even remember what it was called that they're coming out with, or maybe it's out by now. But but this is the one that's uh, pretty appealing to me because it is the old BAR that a lot of us have never even held, much less shot. Um, Thirty out six, Warhorse. Of World War II, Korea, and uh, again was used in World War One. I. I read, I don't know how true this was, that John Browning's son fought in World War One and actually used one of these in in, in, a, in an engagement. Okay, so uh, I don't know how accurate that was, but that's, that's pretty interesting. Oh, this is the Gun Dad design, <laughs> you know. So the Browning B A R. Man, uh, what a hoss! And uh, if you if you have always thought they looked heavy, uh, believe me, they are heavy, and uh, they're uh, <laughs> they are a handful. But once you get to pulling the trigger and firing, they feel really good. But I don't know that I have ever fired a powerful uh, rifle cartridge that way. I mean, it's like a, a tripod mounted or some kind of gigantic belt fed thing because it's so heavy it just doesn't really hardly move you so so pretty cool pretty cool do I even have to tell you life is good You get a spray can down there. <laughs>